this. This is actually a big deal right now. <laughs> I was just talking about this at lunch and wow. But we are able to focus on our job. And our job is quick brainstorm list, get down people, events, places, to help you write down essays, but also trigger memories. Do that before you read the documents. Don't read the documents until you start getting that context. And the other thing about reading the documents after that, let's say you, you forgot stuff. <coughs> the documents will remind you of things. It will give you a little bit of background when you read it. That is when you read the documents. And here's the thing. I gave you, you notice that space there. So when you read the documents, underline it, jot down what's in the document, what parts of the document you're going to use that you could use to reinforce your argument, but also when you have to talk about why they did this, you know, the historical content, you know, the audience, or the purpose, the point of view, jot those things down. And the big reason is this. If you don't jot this down, you think, I know document one, I've got it. By the time you get to document five, guess what you've forgotten? And you have a limited amount of time, and you're flipping back for the documents because you didn't jot anything down and you can't remember. The clock is ticking, you're running out of time. So jot it down and make it easier to go back. All right, next. Um, read, uh, go through the documents, and then you write your thesis statement. Write your thesis statement after you've done your brainstorm list and gone through the documents and think about how you're going to write it. And the reason why we don't write the thesis statement until you after you've gone through the documents, you have to get evidence from six documents into your essay. So that means you might have to kind of tinker with your thesis about the way you might have originally thought about writing the essay to get all the documents in. You have to think just a little bit different to get a couple documents per paragraph. Never know what I mean by that? And then don't forget, you have to get the main point of the question and then take your position answering the question. Take a position. Then, in a, either the same sentence or another sentence, go through the blueprint of what your paragraphs will be. Now, let's look at the question for the exam, the question I gave you. <coughs> Analyze the factors that led to secession and civil war. So what do you have to get in there? You have to make sure you mention what in your question. Yeah, you got to have that in there somewhere. But then you got to talk about something that will tie all the factors in, a position that will show that you understand the factors. And what is the biggest factor? Everything revolve back to what? Just something about slavery. There's my big hint on writing the thesis statement for this essay. It all comes back to slavery. And then when you do your blueprints, the blueprint, you know, the subtopics for your paragraphs, that second part, all will relate to slavery, won't you? So it all tie together. So you ask a question, you have this common theme, and you can go from there. That would be a good, solid thesis. All right, next. Next. Then you outline. Outline. And in the outline, make sure you put down what the documents you use. Now, you have to use six documents. The DBQ I gave you has eight. So you can throw two out. The, the AP exam last year had seven. The last couple years had seven. So throw one out. Did anyone here take AP Euro? No one did? Bryson did. Thanks, Bryson. He's still a little old. Got dang. <laughs> So he won't be able to help us out with that. But I think they had seven too. The thing about that is, they allow, um, I'm going to give you so you can throw two out. We usually let you throw one out. You're going to get one of those documents like, how do I use this? Or what is this even talking about? You don't you need to use that at all. You can throw those out. And so you have to use six. So show where you use them. But the second part is this. So remember yesterday? We did that first sentence or sentence or two, you know, about basically showing how, like I said, you know, Calhoun's positive, good theory of slavery, we try to unify the South, you know, I talked about. It. And then for three of the documents, you need that second part about why they did this. Remember, that's that hat historical context, audience, purpose, or point of view. And that's why I keep writing hat on that. That's all I mean by that. You must explain using historical content or the kind of purpose or point of view 
why Calhoun had the positive good theory in slavery, why Harry Beecher Stowe wrote the Uncle Tom's Cabin, why the Republican Party platform said what it did. For three of them, and put that down in your outline. On my webpage, I have the tips, guidelines for the essay, uh, sample thesis statements. You have a lot of information on there that I didn't give you in class, but I also have, actually, I think this could be cookies. One, here's a bunch of sample outlines. I don't know how I got them turned sideways, but you can figure it out when you get there. And this is actually from two years ago, but very nice little uh, brainstorm list, little thesis, she put documents down. Here's another one. And here she put down, she went through last year, put down um, where she's going to use the historical content, the half, and the same thing here. And one more thing about these. So you can look at these on and draw my webpage. But see how much information she has there? I'm going to let you have your brainstorming outline on Tuesday when we write the exam. But it's got to look something like that. Don't write your essay in your outline. I, I let a few things go because I wanted people to feel good about that first essay. But don't write all the information down. You're going to try to write your outline if you did a quick one before you wrote it. So yeah, you have it prepared, you've thought about it, but something like that, just for, for like just one or two words or thought, that's all you're going to have. Yeah. And after this essay, we'll have to do it all today, right? Uh, we'll do a regular essay like that. The DBQ, uh, probably not. Okay. The last one we do for sure, we'll do it right before. We just have to hand it to you. Clock is running. Which, you know, it gets easier each time. And so I have that. Next, then you start writing. And once you, if you get a good outline, have it organized, it gets so much easier to write. You know, you just have to do it. You know, obviously, you got to do the work and write it, but it's there in front of you. Now, that opening paragraph, do not forget this. The first three or four sentences, they've got to be context, big picture, what's going on around the country. Not just narrowly about secession. So you're going to talk about the 1850s. Talk about the Industrial Revolution, the expansion of railroads, the new political parties being formed, manifest destiny, expansion westward, gold, changing economy, ending of 1857. You know, things like that that aren't necessarily to the to the question, but give an idea of what's going on in the country outside of this. Context, big picture. Get people, events, time, you know, when it happened, 1850s. And, and I'll show you this in a second. But that's really important. Not only does it give you a couple of things. First off, it helps organize your essay. It makes it stronger. It also gives you a chance to show off what you know. That's the first thing you can do right away. That, I'm reading that essay to Marcus Brady. You think, wow, this person knows their stuff. I'm expecting a good essay. I like them. If you don't have that, then I immediately think, ooh, people don't even know what's going on. You want me to think the opposite, right? Yes, I'm human. And then lastly, it's a point on the AP essay. It's one point out of six on the long essay, and it's one point out of seven on the DPQ. That's a lot of points. So get that down. I'll show you a sample from last year. Boy, did they go to town on it. And then, thesis. Don't forget to underline your thesis. And then, your paragraphs. Your body paragraphs, topic sentence, and then a document. On average, if you're doing a five paragraph essay, two documents per paragraph, remember that is going to be used as your examples. So, if we do a short idea and you do an example from what you know, well, now you have to do a couple of examples from what you glean from the documents. And then, remember for three of them, you got to have one additional sentence. So one or two sentences about what you got from the documents to prove your argument, and then for three of them, one sentence about why they had, or why they said that, why they believe that, something about them or what's going on. And then lastly, if you look down, it says the body paragraphs, the second to the last thing, and this can be anywhere in the paragraph. Everyone's outside information. Historical evidence that you know outside of the documents. So just one more example, that you know. So if the documents don't talk about the Dred Scott decision, you can bring that in. If the documents don't talk about the Compromise of 1850, that could be an example you can bring in. Outside information. Not only does that, does that strengthen your argument, but also that's a point on the AP exam. And it gives you a chance to show up. 
Throwing off is not bad in this. Throwing off is not a bad thing. Moss is related to talk. I can drop 16 times. No, I don't want that. And then, next, conclusion, basically the same kind of thing, kind of showing you through the thesis, maybe come out to the context, least important paragraph. And, a few things then. Don't just put a list of documents down. Make sure they always relate back to your thesis. And don't summarize the documents. And I wrote that down here. Where do I have that down here? So number three, don't summarize the documents. Don't just simply say what's in it or describe it if it's a political cartoon or something like that. All of you can write a summary. You need to use what's in the document to reinforce your argument. You have to relate it back to your topic sentence in the paragraph, which remember, your topic sentence is in your thesis. So as long as you do that, you're in good shape. Act like when you, when you do a DBQ that I, whoever's writing it, know every word in the document, but know nothing else. So don't tell me what's in the document, just tell me how this relates to answering your question. And quotes. Do not copy quotes. Do not copy things from the documents. I'll give you one exception. Copying, that's like, and I've actually done this. Maybe you have too. <coughs> I don't know what to say. Well, I'll copy a long passage. There, I got a paragraph. It's kind of a red flag, like maybe you don't know. Right? What you know, your words. But let's say there's like a, a little phrase in one of the documents that perfectly fits your argument. Up to five words. You can use that a couple times. Like it's just perfect for your argument. A phrase that said fits in to show that point of view, shows what you're trying to get across. They will get what I mean by that. No first person personal pronouns. Uh, oh, one more thing. You have to cite your documents. So let's say you have two sentences about a document. At the end of that second sentence, one sentence, first sentence. After you're done using that document, put this at the end. Doc one or doc two or whatever it might be. And even underline it. Make sure they see it. Make sure they see it. That you use them. And one more thing, it is improper to say this. Let's say you want to talk about a document. Let's say the positive good theory of slavery. We all know what that is. Don't say, in document three, write down a Calhoun's positive good theory of slavery. The first document on what I gave you in the Republican platform of 1860. And then at the end, put doc one. Now, you will see examples. And there's one on there that they probably didn't take any points off. The person reading it said, hey, there are time tests, I'll give them credit. But that is improper to use that. And boy, would I hate for you, when we get to the AP exam, for you to lose credit because you broke down into document one. You get somebody grading it, and they're, and they're tired, and they're kind of annoyed. And they say, oh, God, not this again. All right, I'm not going to give them the credit. Wouldn't you hate to lose a point for that? Okay. <laughs> I don't know if I would do it or not, but I can see you getting really tired. Oh, one more thing. When you put down your outside information on a sentence, or let's say you know those sentences, the three ones you have to explain why they have that point of view you don't have, the beginning of the sentence, just put a little star above the first one. You mean just a little star above that first one. So you have the just a little star right there. And the reason why is this, to alert the person reading that something there is important. Don't make it big, don't make it cluttered, but just a little mark. Uh, yeah? So that's just for the second half? Mm -hmm. the whole thing? Just for the second. Just for the second half. Just a little star. And the reason why is, okay, it helped, you know, kind of get a big stack of essays and the words start coming together. It does help. But the other thing is, heck, when we get the AP exam, think about somebody for five days has read a thousand essays. That means they're going to get 90 seconds to two minutes for every essay. And that's the reason why I don't grade. <laughs> I'm not a grader. But that's why we underline the thesis. That's why we put those little marks there. That's why we underline it. Don't make them look for it. There you go. I got this big stack. I look for it now. You know, people are human. They do stuff like that. So I'll help them out. So let's look at this very first document. Everybody look at document one of the of the essay of the one I'm giving you. 
What's the first thing you do when you get a document? What do you read? Title and author and time. When? So read the first one. By the way, some documents might be this short, some might be a little bit longer, as long as they draw all right. So go and quick read. And by the way, I'll, I'll make sure you always have some space. Please write. So, what's it saying? No slavery. No slavery territories? So, what does it mean? What do we call that point of view? The popular side would be say, hold on. This is free soil. No slavery territory. And by the way, that's fine. Okay, you know, you can, it's not that big of a deal. But hopefully, when you go through, oh, yeah, I remember that. Oh, that's fine. And does it say free soil? Have you just used outside information? You already say the essay, but also show that you know what's going on without it. That's all we want. This shows a free soil argument. Free soil argument. That's all it does in that first one. And that's what you use in the essay. I showed that free soil. The Republicans were free soil. Oh. Doc one. Now, the rest of the documents, you know, document two is pretty short. Three is a little bit longer. Five is from a diary, and it's a little bit longer, but there's a lot of things you can use for different points of view. It's a pretty good document. But remember, it's a diary, so you're going to get a little bit of how they wrote. And the last document, you notice it's a map. It's an election of 1860. Now, you're not going to get a lot of bias or point of view on this one, but there's a lot of historical context about the sectionalism, the new party, the Republicans, things like that. And you also notice, if you look at the map, you notice Lincoln was only, only got votes in the North. He wasn't even on the ballot in the Southern states, and he was elected president. That should give you an idea how divided the country was. Did you that nowadays? Show more on the ballot? Oh, yeah. Every state has a different rule on this. Every state has a different rule. We're a real hodgepodge. We're a real hodgepodge in this country. So, let me show you one more thing then. I put down the 2018 essay, and if you click right here, this will give you, I think it's this one. So this is the one they gave the class last year. So that's the same stuff I wrote down here, so don't worry about that. But right here, that's the question. Evaluate the relative important, or importance of different causes for the expanding role of the United States in the world from 1865, in the period from 1865 to 1910. Now, if you look at that and say, I don't know, well, you know, we haven't gotten there yet. Don't worry about it. But this, after the class, was really happy. Because they were happy. Most of them. And did really well on it. Because it's things like the Spanish American War. Imperialism, big stick diplomacy, it's called. Uh, we'll get to it, don't worry. <laughs> the Filipino insurrection, the Panama Canal, things like that. They really, I mean, that's, they were ready. So they, this class, and you'll be ready to get mine, of course, and you won't get the same one. I'm sorry. But that's what they had last year. And you can go and take a look at it. But what they also have, if you click the link for uh, sample answers on the DBQ, if you scroll down a little bit, it has three different samples, a good one, a medium, and a really bad one. And here, this person goes to town on context in the first paragraph. I mean, they really write a lot and do a very good job talking about industrialization and different laws. And you can and write pretty well, don't they? That's a pretty easy one to read. But then it goes through the rest of the paragraph. And I'll give you an example, a really good example of what we talked about, that first part of using the document. Captain Albert Third Mahan argued for a stronger Navy to complement the obvious superiority of America and to take part in imperialism or to increase the nation's influence of the weaker Caribbean and Central American countries. Doctrine. We'll get to who met Mahan, so don't worry about that. But the point is that is that pretty much what we did yesterday? And you notice what they did, what he or she did, whoever it is. Start out with who did it? Finish with that. So that's in there. They have one that's okay and one not. Wow. Of course, I've seen some pretty funny answers on DBQ exams. Before we get to the test, I'll tell you a few of those. 
Any questions? You want to just do it now? So, yeah. You don't want us to put a document on it. You do. At the end of the sentence, put it. Okay. But don't write in it, don't say at the beginning of the sentence. In document one, write down the Republican platform. But then at the end of it, or if you use two sentences at the end of the second sentence, write down, and it can't be in the middle at the end of the sentence. So you name it up to start from the straight line. Yep. Yep. And that way you for sure get credit, and also a good way to start. Everyone knows what you're talking about. And if it's map, just say, as the map of the election of 1860 shows. So, tomorrow, look through the documents. I'll ask if there's any questions on the documents, and then I'll do them one more time on Monday. And I think you have trouble setting up the beginning of the beginning of class. And then on Tuesday, you'll come in, you have your brainstorm outline thesis, the documents, you will need paper, and then you start writing. Yes? So just looking at document seven, how would you put that in your paper? It's super long. You can just say like a letter from Jefferson Davis. Yeah, just say as as, as, Jeff, as Jefferson Davis stated. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's all you have to say. Okay, yeah. Good, good question on that one. Yeah, I'll remember to tell other people that. Just as Jefferson Davis. Okay. Yeah, I should. I got to remind myself to say that the other boxes. That was a good question. I wasn't even thinking about that. All right, and now I know you got to get six documents in. I know you got to get a three. You got to read that. But the documents will really help you out. They steer you in a direction. They'll give you hints on the, the answers. They'll give you a lot of hints on things, historical points that you might have forgotten. And so we have, to, uh, we have a, a regular essay question, long essay, where you get this question. It's only what you know here. We'll give you some hints. It really does help. So let's go ahead then and finish up where we're at. Where were we, by the way? Uh, the only one more tonight is go through this. There might be a quiz tomorrow on the reason. I decided not to do it today because I want to go through this. But I finished chapter 14. Might be like a little eight question quiz. Yeah. Stephen Douglas, the little giant, he broke up the bill. Who broke the compromise of 1850? Uh, Raul C. Calhoun. Okay. Ha, ha, ha. Okay. Did we get to this? No. Now, the thing about the Compromise of 1850, did it save the Union? No. No. Union, the, no Union anymore? Oh, <laughs> It didn't stop war, but it saved you. You can argue it saved. If the war would have been fought in 1850, the South would have won, without a doubt. In fact, the South had many advantages. They almost won in 1865 or 1864. They almost won. But this map shows you one of the big reasons why. Those are railroads. Look how many railroads in 1850. You know, that's just starting. Look at the difference in industrial growth in the North. This shows it more than any other picture. The industrial growth over those 10 years would be decisive for the victory of the United States in the Civil War. Those 10 years arguably saved the country. Arguably. Still could have lost, but 1950 would have been so difficult to win. Railroads, industrial growth would be key. I've always wondered what this railroad is. Why just there? So, 1852, a presidential election. The euphoria over the Compromise of 1850 continued to go on. Did we pass the Compromise? No. Why did it say pass? No, Douglas broke it up. Oh, Douglas broke it up and passed it. Did I show you how it changed? The fugitive? Uh, no, no slave trade. No slave trade. Okay, so that it did pass. All right. The Free Soul Party was pretty much, they lost their steam. No, they'll come back. Don't worry. But the waste drive one more time with the general, Winfield Scott. The problem is he doesn't have that cool nickname like old Rough and Ready. Do you remember what his nickname was? Rough and Ready was Taylor. 
Fuss and feathers. Oh, fuss and feathers. Oh, fuss and feathers didn't have it. And so the Democrats had a big advantage. Franklin Pierce would be the nominee, and he was what they called a dough face, as in bread dough. Dough face. A northerner that supported the South. Dough face. And this is one of these weird analogies that kind of, you know, time periods have that makes perfect sense in 1852, but doesn't really make a lot of sense today. Red dough is white, right? Think about red dough. So imagine you see someone with red dough, so they look like they're white, as in the white republic of the North. But you take it off, he has blackface, meaning for the slave kingdom in the South. I know that doesn't really make sense. This way, if he's black, is he a slave? I know. Don't get yourself bogged down to those things. Just simply don't fix. And this is going to be a real problem for the Democrats. The Democrats are going to take Northerners to support the South. It's going to happen a few times. And so with that, Pierce would win a huge victory. This would be the last national victory where a president won in all sections, the last one until 1932. Anybody know who was elected in 1932? FDR, yeah. And so, and you know, the free cell vote lost a lot. It declined dramatically. So with that, almost immediately, in fact, the same year, Uncle Tom's cabin came out. We already know what Uncle Tom's cabin is, so I need to go through the details of that. But this book would become an international bestseller, the bestseller of the year night of the years of the decade 1850s. It's, it is a good book. It's it's a little bit melodramatic, but then again, that was the style of the time. This fictional account, and yes, it's anti-slavery, but one of the big things, it was anti. Oh, this is a this is her after the war, when Lincoln met her, when they met, when Abraham Lincoln met her in 1862, when he was president, he, he said, oh, so you're the little lady who started this war. He kind of meant it as a compliment, but doesn't sound also kind of bad there. Well, the big issue was the Fugitive Slave Law. And the Fugitive Slave Law was infuri infuriated northern northern states. It did a couple things. First off, it said that all male citizens have to join a posse to run down run, runaway slaves, what they call fugitives, to run down fugitives. Do you know what a posse is? It's a group. <laughs> You're on the right track. It is have a group, usually at this time, men. And they would have like an informal deputization. The dep uh, sheriff would make them like a short-term deputy, and then they could, they would, um, then they would ride down and try to capture prisoners or try to capture um, uh, suspects. I was thinking about bad movies, and they get a posse to go and chase the bank robber or something. They must join this so take a temporary deputization, or they go to jail for up to ten years. And that completely superseded state laws. It said that this is a federal law, so they have to do it. But not only that, if a fugitive is caught, they must go in front of the judge to see whether or not they're a fugitive, a runaway, or a free person. Because what does a fugitive slave look like? Free person. Yeah. You see, people use black. And that's what they, they just go find black people and kidnap them. So if the judge said that they are free, the judge will get $5 compensation for the paper. $5 is pretty good amount of money there. If they find them to be a fugitive, they get 10. Yeah. Now, the idea was, of course, they got to do more paperwork, and judges are incorruptible. Well, as it turns out, no, they're not. Judges are human, too. It definitely looks like a bribe, doesn't it? So it looked like this was superseding state law. State laws, northern states were furious, and they would pass a series of laws called personal liberty laws. And these personal liberty laws were basically laws that said, or to supersede the fugitive slave law, that said you don't have to obey it. Or a big one they would do in states like Massachusetts, they would tell local <coughs> law enforcement agencies to not enforce the fugitive slave law. And this would be a poster. This was put up in 1852. 
Same year as Uncle Don's cabin. Same year as an election. Warning people, free blacks, that kidnappers and slave catchers are coming up to collect that reward. The rewards were over a thousand blacks for these runaway slaves. The second most popular book, popular book of the 1850s in the United States was a book about a man who was kidnapped and sold into slavery for 12 years in Louisiana. They did a movie about the book. You remember the name of the movie? 12 years, yeah, 12 years a Slave. It was the second most popular book of this decade. Did anyone see the movie? It's it's pretty harsh, and I guess slavery was worse. It was worse. Yeah. I'm oh, sorry. And so, why not? <laughs> and so, it would warn out more. And you, how did the South react to this? They were furious. And it wasn't just, why did you obey the law? They saw this as a direct attack on their way of life. They saw this as a direct attack on them personally. They're not obeying the law. Our slaves are going to run away. This might trigger a slave rebellion. That's literally, to their point of view, uh, the North is stealing from us because they're stealing our property. And they became more and more virulent about defending their right to have slaves and to force northern states to promote slave or protect slavery too. And they call this defense of slavery by the middle of the 1850s states' rights. States' rights became their defense of slavery. Now, they do not really mean that states should have rights. They wanted northern states to ignore their own laws and enforce this. All states' rights meant was let us have slaves and make sure that the federal government protects our slaves. That's what states' rights meant. What was that type of economics I told you about? Where they said, hands off of competition, yet dramatic help for big business. And so, isn't that kind of the same thing? Using a word, but actually it has a couple of different meanings. In the 1950s and the 1960s, states' rights would come back. That's anti what? Anti civil rights. States' rights was a way of saying, I don't want equal rights for Americans. And long after the Civil War, when they would start to go back and say, try to, um, you know, come up with a new reason why they did the Civil War, they bring back, we were fighting for states' rights. They were going to turn war between the states. That came long after the war was over. So, with that, you have this issue, and the South was not done. They're thinking, okay, what if we don't get these states? We need more slave states. And this was going to be called filibustering or filibusters. Filibusters were basically a bunch of freebooters. They're like pirates. There were southerners, they show them like these ruffians right here. And they were going down to Latin America to try to overthrow these new governments and get the U.S. to annex them, to make them into what kind of states. In fact, it even happened in Nicaragua. This is a picture right here of David Walker. He actually organized a coup over through the government, was a dictator there for a little bit over a year. He tried to take Costa Rica, too, and try to get it annexed into the United States as a slave state. And he, there was a coup, and he was assassinated. That's one of the things about dictatorships. They usually don't end nicely for the dictator. They do end. But they're trying to organize rebellion. So they're pirates, essentially. And this is showing the pirates forcing the Secretary of State, James Buchanan, by coercing him to say that the government is for this. And the doe Face Pierce's government would issue the Austin Manifesto. It's called the Austin Doctrine here, but it means the same thing. And it means the U.S. is going to try to take Cuba and turn it into what? Yeah, they thought they get two slice states on it. The entire 19th century, the United States had been eyeing Cuba, the Spanish colony. Spain was weak. I wonder if it eventually is going to happen. 1898. And he was in Belgium, that's why it's in Austin. And it's not that the U.S. government did it, but they said, we want to get Cuba. And the point about that was northerners were furious. Slave powers expanding it. And they, this is why they draw them like a bunch of bullets. You see the six-barrel pistol right there? 
they would muzzle load each pistol barrel and you could fire one, you could turn it and then fire it again. So it'd be, it'd be like the first revolver. Now sometimes they would explode in the hand and that would morale the shooter. <laughs> that was pretty scary. But one more thing about filibuster. Have you ever heard the term filibuster today? Yes. You know what it is? It's it was a waste time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it almost generically means waste time, yeah. It essentially means like it's where um, a member of Congress will talk for hours on end to stop a law being passed that most recently happened when Elizabeth Warren stopped the law. And, um, uh, yeah, actually, it happens. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> well, it's in the Senate. And so, John Norris, it's only in the Senate, and it's called a filibuster. And it's literally what it is is the Senate has unlimited debate. And what it means is they cannot vote on a law until the debate is done. So what happens? They just get up and talk. And you can't vote until they're done talking. And what a great way to solve it. And then, then it was going to become, let's say someone asks you a question you don't want to answer, you just start babbling to make it time. <laughs> That's filibustering. So you're, you're exactly right. They actually filibuster every law. Yeah, and every last thing was notable. We just happened, there was one to break a filibuster yesterday. And here's the thing that happens with a filibuster. What happens is, if you can't vote on a law until um, the debate is done, you get a whole bunch of senators, and they can literally take over the Senate and talk. In 1957, segregationist senators stopped the Civil Rights Bill for 64 days. Jesus. Talk straight, 24 hours a day, for 61 days in 1964. And... They started doing it, not very often, most bills they didn't do it back then, in the 1850s, and that's why they called it a filibuster, like you're taking over. And so get that down for the unlimited speech. By the way, when I said it today, after Lyndon Johnson and Mike Pence, Little Montana, and a few others um, waited them out and got that civil rights bill passed, once that happened, this is what happens today. It requires 60 votes in the Senate to stop a filibuster. And so all that happens today is <clears throat> a senator just has to simply say, I'm going to filibuster. I'm going to filibuster this bill. You're not going to vote on I'm going to filibuster. And they immediately vote. It's called cloture to end the filibuster. And they're brought 60 votes. How many members of Congress are there? How many members of the Senate, I'm sorry, are there? How many? 100. So it requires a super majority to stop a filibuster. If they don't get over, if they don't get over sixty votes, they just move on to the next bill. That is why nothing happens in the Senate today. Nothing. They used to not do it so much, but beginning a little bit, Republicans did a lot to Clinton, but then Republicans filibustered every single bill <coughs> under President Obama. Every bill, and now the Democrats are basically. Trump. That's why nothing passes. There's a few little, like, but you want to complain about the government? People say, oh, why does the government do anything? Well, that is why. In fact, talk to a member of the House of the Senate, and they'll tell you it's much different now because they filibuster everything. So, with that, that's where the term comes from. And let's get to Stephen Douglas. Back to Douglas. We can't ever escape Douglas, the little John. By the way, isn't that a bad picture? <coughs> He was about five foot five, five foot six. That's why they called him the little giant. And the thing was, there's a lot of pictures of people like pointing, like, I'm in charge, follow me. But look where he's looking up. Look how he's doing it. What does that look like? Doesn't it make him look like he's talking to somebody much bigger than him? It makes him look almost smaller. In fact, that wasn't the pose they wanted. Douglas of Illinois really looked like he's going to be president. And so, he wanted a big victory, and the big victory was that he could organize the Transcontinental Railroad, organize government help to build the railroad. Now, it's not C to C. Railroads have been to about the Mississippi River by then, so it's to connect there and go to the Pacific. There were two basic routes that Douglas wanted. Well, actually, two basic routes they were talking about. A southern route from either Memphis or New Orleans. Remember that Gadsden Purchase I told you about? goes from here, up there, and then the northern route. Doesn't see that north to us, but here. That's what Douglas wanted. 
Douglas wanted a northern route. If he could get this northern route, it'd be a huge victory for him. So we're going to look at this map. What was the law that said these territories would be free above 36 feet? The Missouri Compromise. Well, they still haven't organized these territories. They're so technically under military rule. And so they have to organize the territories first. They have to have, to have territorial government before they can build the railroads. We're here. Utah's already has territorial government. That's already state. So when Douglas proposed to try and make these into two free territories, who went nuts? What were the Southern congressmen that were uncompromising by then? The fire eaters. And they said, no, we're not going to give you your railroad unless you open this all up to Syracuse. And what did Douglas do? He blew up the country. Yep. Literally Straight. blew up the country. The Kansas Nebraska Act. The Kansas Nebraska Act would repeal the Missouri Compromise, opening up those areas to slavery, and then said popular sovereignty in Kansas and Nebraska. They would decide down the road, meaning they must be open up to slavery right then. More people moved into Kansas, so they would decide their constitution sooner, Nebraska later. By the way, look at the map of Nebraska. We're in Nebraska territory, so we were opened up to slavery for about seven years. Not many, hardly, but still, it was there. And this changed everything. First thing you got to write down is this, the Whig Party imploded. Boom. No more Whigs. And the Whigs have been around for a long time. Hundreds of congressmen, two presidents, gone. Northern Whigs split, and what did Southern Whigs do? They joined the Democrats, because that was Douglas's party for Kansas, Nebraska. So the Democratic Party is going to become very anti-slavery. I'm sorry, did I say anti-slavery? Which would have been a shock to them. Pro slavery. Free civil Democrats might need another party. Hmm. And then civil war began almost immediately. Bleeding Kansas. <clears throat> Pro slavery people, free soil people moved into Kansas. There are more free soilers. But Missouri's right next door, and that's a slave state. So they began to move in. Right along this border, that's why you have this very weird thing where you have the pro-slavery Kansas City, Missouri, and then that's why they had a Kansas City, Kansas, because we're free soilers. Never go there. It's kind of weird. It's two towns. That was this big metro area. And Jayhawkers, those were the free soilers. They called themselves Jayhawkers. So they're now the Jayhawk stage. So the University of Kansas, so they named the Jayhawks. And they were, they wore, their informal cavalry, because it began a guerrilla war, they wore red breeches, red pants, they call themselves red legs. And here are a bunch of Jayhawkers, and I love this picture for any other reason, look at their hats. They all got top hats on. I just think that's not the coolest thing. And they go, when I go to war, I got my top hat. Right. I always think of the top hat for Monopoly when I look at that. But the anti slavery people, because so many from Missouri could just cross over and get involved, they were called border ruffians. And they could even vote in the elections because it was unclear. And so I like this picture because it shows border ruffians getting whiskey and they're going back to vote. All right, then we will. Oh, we got to beat some of up. Who's going to be Sumner? You're Sumner? Okay. Yes! Let me find it. Same deal, I gotta find it. I've been going through and grading stuff. We're going to become border ruffians, people. Are you you're cool with that? Yeah. 
Mr. Partridge. All right, I'm <laughs> trying to find an essay. <laughs> I don't need it right now. I've got by in the mall, I promise. <laughs> can, I, can I throw this at people? This is no, because you don't have a degree. Do you have a degree? Do you have a degree? No, yeah. Okay. Kind of you're pretty over top then, aren't you? You think you're going to get a degree. I don't know. I don't know. That would be very happy. Thank you. You're still good. It's not like you're taking it. I think you got a degree. You're just going to break it. You're just going to break it. Who's going to go first? Oh, okay. Hey! No! No! Okay, Delaney, it's first. <laughs> 